Welcome to the second part of our history of God's church. In the first segment, we saw how powerfully the apostles and the disciples spread the kingdom in the first century. Over the years, a pattern emerged. People left the scriptures, the church declined, but God raised up people to rebuild it. I was impressed with the hearts of people like Luther, Wesley, and Campbell who called their cultures back to the Bible. But I was also surprised how limited their impact was and how quickly their churches lost their unity and purpose. And this is a great lesson for God's people today. We need to learn the lessons from the past so we don't repeat the same mistakes in the future. This segment of history on God's modern day movement begins the first of two parts. We begin with 1979 to 1989. And you will especially enjoy the early pictures of the leaders. I really appreciate the incredible job that the Kingdom teachers did. And truly what I appreciate it most is how they weaved through the centuries that the hand and the spirit of God was always flickering. The lamp of God never went out. The kingdom may have been dormant. It may have been in seed form, the word of God, but it was always available for the man who loved God and his word. As a young man, I was raised with really no sense of Christianity. I always believed in Jesus. In high school, I got involved in the Methodist Church, a fundamentalist Methodist Church. I loved it. I loved the Word of God. I became president of the MYF. <laughs> and yet we moved away, and we went to a liberal Methodist Church my senior year. And there was emptiness. And my life began to drift, and it drifted more as a freshman in college. I remember rushing the fraternity and not drinking a thing. And yet after I had become a, a brother, I would carry around a, a half a glass of beer just to try to relate. <laughs> I remember the night that I w was made a brother in the fraternity, Sigma Chi. I fell into impurity for the first time in my life. It was gross, and it was a dark time. Amazingly enough, I was not asked to come to church up until that time. I think that the Lord knew I wasn't ready. When I was in that sin, I knew I was a far away from God. I consider myself a Christian. I even taught Bible study at the Methodist Church as a freshman. And I remember after dinner one night, Sam came up and says, hey, I want to invite you to Friday night devotional. Now, some of the guys at the house had warned me about the soul talk, <laughs> that there were strange things going on. <laughs> but they hadn't said anything about the devotional, so when they heard about the devotional, I said, yeah, I'd love to come. And I went, and I saw something special. I remember going out that night just uh, with Sam and Jerry, and went to this great spot, this pie place. <laughs> we just talked about what it meant to be a Christian. And I started coming fairly regularly, thinking that I was kind of a part of the church. <laughs> and I remember them studying with me baptism on a Sunday night about a month and a half later. And I, I, I'd been through all the navigator studies. I've been through all the stuff. And I mean, this just shook me to the core because it meant I wasn't a true Christian. Now, part of me was fighting it. But part of me was going, oh, great. I hadn't really messed up as a Christian then. <laughs> and I fought. And I remember coming to the Bible study the next night and being 
talking about baptism. I mean, he studied about baptism the whole night. And I said, I, I just went on up. I said, listen, I'm ready to go. He said, what do you mean you're ready to go? I said, I'm ready to go. Well, don't you understand this commitment, that commitment, this commitment, that? Yes, I'm ready to go. I want to make Jesus Lord tonight. They couldn't talk me out of it. There are only four people at my baptism, and I was one of them. <laughs> but it was 1.30 in the morning, and I knew I needed to get baptized at 1.30 in the morning because the next day was not assured. And I became a true Christian. 1.30 in the morning, April 11th, 1972. I love the campus ministry there at the then 14th Street Church of Christ that becomes Crossroads. I appreciate the relationships. I appreciate what they stood for. And as time went on and I went into the ministry, I was in for the shock of my life. I went on, my first ministry situation was in Philadelphia. And I was kind of disappointed because, you see, as a young guy, my dream was to be the campus minister at Harvard. See, in my mind, it was the greatest university in the world. Amen. Amen. <laughs> But the Lord, the Lord did not send me to Boston at that time. I went to Philadelphia. I worked as a campus minister at a Christian college. And I was shocked at the sin and the prejudice. I was shocked at the Pentecostalism there and the liberalness of the elders in the congregation at the King of Prussia Church on who was a Christian and who was not. The first guy that I reached out to uh, at one of the uh, secular colleges was the son of a Presbyterian preacher. And I still remember the preacher saying to me, well, you know, he's not really becoming a Christian. It's just great that, that he's getting baptized. I said, no, he's becoming a Christian. He's getting born again. No, 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 no. He is a Christian. His father's a Presbyterian minister. I said, listen, he's not a Christian. He's getting baptized this afternoon. <laughs> that caused a little controversy. And then, as you would have, the first kid that I, I, I worked with off Northeastern Christian College campus was also the kid of a Presbyterian minister. And once more, she got baptized. By that fall, I was feeling so sorry for myself. I still remember going to an elders meeting and saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to resign. I, I told the elders that. They went around, and five out of the six said, no, 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 we, we want you to stay. But the sixth one said, well, Maybe, maybe, maybe it's time to go. That ticked me off. <laughs> they said, just think about it. I thought about it, I came back. And I preached the word, but I saw there was no place to go. The elders and the preacher were going to block it. There was no decision. And so I quit after 10 months. I went to Charleston, Illinois, because Roger Lamb wanted to have a campus minister. I still wanted to go to Harvard. And I said, there aren't a lot of job openings right now in this Charleston, Illinois. There's 18,000 people in that city and 9,000 kids on the campus. And this Roger guy wants me to come. So I said, now, Raj, I, you know, are, are you guys solid on the doctrine? <laughs> oh, yes, bro. We just preach the truth here in this church. I still remember the first devotional gathered with the elders and uh, the, the few kids that were, Church of Christ kids that were there. And one of the elders shared, I remember when I was seven years old coming down the aisle in the Baptist church and praying Jesus in my heart. And boy, it was so great to become a Christian. <laughs> I looked over at Roger. I mean to tell you. <laughs> we went upstairs and we had a talk. Then I found out that Roger had had this All-America basketball player come and speak at the church because he was in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. But I began to figure out a lot of things there. <laughs> I said, you know, these guys aren't Christians. They may be elders, but they've not been baptized, making Jesus Lord, being totally committed. And so in my heart, I still wanted to go to Boston and Harvard. And through the working of the Spirit, the time was right. I remember getting a phone call, and 
the fall of 78 and going out to interview. And I still remember meeting the Gimples for the first time in the Moorhead, staying in the Moorhead's house, and meeting the congregation. I mean, there was a deacon that smoked. Half the church didn't come midweek. Head of the preaching program was a Harvard graduate student, theology student. Thought the first 11 chapters of the Bible were mythical. And at the end of that visit, I go, I'm not sure I really want to come. <laughs> Once more, called for a decision, January 1. I said, I can't, I can't make a decision. I said, I'm not going to go to that kind of situation. Here's the only situation I'm going to go to. The only situation I'm going to go to is where, A, I'm the preacher. I, I've got to have the pulpit. Number two, and you see, they were wanting to keep me as campus minister and this other guy as a preacher. I said, no, we're not going to do that. Number two, everybody's got to be totally committed. Everybody's got to come to all the services. And I'm not going to go into a situation where you have a little group of committed people and all these uncommitted adults. So I go back again and visit in March. I said, no, still not ready. At the end of April, I go back again. And I asked several of the key people in my life, should I go? I said, no, bro, you need to stay in Charleston. You're building a good work there. It's an incredible campus ministry. But something inside of me says, this was it. You see, then New England was a mission field. <laughs> Biggest church there was about 100 in, in all of New England. And people were saying, you know, that's a hard field. You sure you want to get there? I mean, you built such a great reputation, such a great name for yourself. But there was a dream. And so I went. I'll never forget the first devotional there in the Gimple's living room. It was an incredible time. Because those 30 would-be disciples really wanted it. I remember that first Sunday, I preached the Word of God, that very text that we started out with right here. I said, this is going to be the standard. And I remember we brought a girl we have been studying with along with us. Her name was Ann Albert. And that day she was baptized. And there's a very special couple in the church. He was one of the elders and his wife, Paul and Helen McNeil. He was 79 years old, and his dream had always been for a great church in the mission field of New England. And his dream was to fill up the Lexington Church building. And I still remember right at the church, Paul and Helen both came on up right after Ann was baptized, and, Ann, and, 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 and Helen just grabbed me, and she just started crying. She says, I can't talk. It's been so long since we've seen a baptism. There have only been two baptisms in the previous three years in that church. The average church of Christ in that day was only baptizing seven people. Six were children of the members. Retention rate out of the one baptism out of the world was only 10%. Retention rate for the children, less than 50%. That's the condition. There was no church in the world that had a totally committed membership. Not even Lexington Church as of January 1, 1979. You see, you've heard the story of the 30 would-be disciples in the Gimple's living room. I've never told the story of the other 30 would-not-be disciples that were not in the living room. And you don't hear about that because there wasn't a split because those people, by the grace of God, left one by one over the course of a year. And no one ever really noticed because in the first year of our work, we had 103 people baptized in the Christ. You say, well, how did that happen? Because I said, we will not only have the Bible as our ideal, as our, as our authority, but it will be the standard for this congregation. Number one, it will be the absolute authority in this church. Number two, every single person in this church will be called to be totally committed. That was the vernacular of that day. And number three, every single person in this church will become evangelistic. Those things had been said in the Crossroads Movement. It had never been done. And through the course of that year, the Lord pruned our church. The 30 would-be disciples became the base. And then the fruit began to come, 103 people in the first year of our work. It was, um, it was amazing how quickly the friendship developed. 
You know, I believe it was the spirit at work, really throwing us together, literally f throwing us together there the first couple of months. But, you know, we built the relationship very quickly, which is really what the church needed. And uh, it, it set a, a tremendous groundwork for the whole process of building relationships across the, the board, because that <laughs> is really the glue that was going to move things forward, was building the family relationships. And, uh, you know, we were just really privileged uh, to be at the right place at the right time. And uh, to have uh, someone uh, like Kip with his attitude uh, to, to really build in, in the direction uh, that the Bible calls us to. Well, you know, as Kip was telling what was happening with him as his, the Lord was leading him, um, Rob and I were praying, along with the Moorheads, that somehow, some way, we would learn how to study the Bible with people. Um, as we knew that we, we did crazy things. I mean, seemed crazy to us at the time. We went and sang at the Lexington Green, and we did things to try. <laughs> Joyce was there, and Doug was there, and we, and the Moorheads were there, and others were there, and we tried our best to figure out how do you reach the people in New England. And um, we started to pray, and we were just the only word that I can think of is we were frustrated because we didn't know how to do that. And we began looking for a couple that could come and teach us how to, um, how to find, help others find the Lord, and in fact, how to find the Lord ourselves. And uh, when Kip and Elena came to Boston, I believe that the friendship and unity that, and the family concepts, it was something that was falling on fertile ground because we were so desperate find somebody that could teach us. And in my heart, I'd always wanted to put 1 Corinthians 13 into practice. And I was um, converted to the mainline church, and I never saw 1 Corinthians 13 put into practice. And I always wanted that. I wanted to have friends that I loved as family, and I wanted to have family that I loved as friends. And, um, you know, to this day, I think I'm still working on that. But Elena and I, I always saw Elena as the leader spiritually in our relationship because some of the qualities in Elena were things that I lacked in a major way. She has a tremendous strength of character as you all know and she has tremendous leadership ability but she also has a common gentle spirit which I really did lack and uh, that common gentle spirit put Kip and I at odds sometimes, the lack of it in me, um, but I admired that so much in Elena. And I loved her like she was a friend, but I also loved her like she was my daughter. And I remember when um, Elena was pregnant with Sean, and she had a hard time in the pregnancy, and there was a point where we thought Sean, we didn't know he was a boy, but we thought that the baby might have died. And I canceled a trip that I was supposed to go on to go with Elena to the hospital to get an ultrasound. And I remember the moment we saw that heartbeat and the kind of um, feelings that you have when you really love somebody as they're having a baby and uh, you know the baby's alive and not dead. And when Sean had surgery because, in fact, he had a congenital um, back defect and we went to Children's Hospital. Gloria was there with us at that time. And to be there at that time and to just be family but friends as well. There were times when Elena needed help. You know, as a young mother, three young children coming quickly, and I would go over and go to church with her and um, help her get ready for church, because we all know that sometimes that's a hectic time in our lives, <laughs> <laughs> getting ready for church. But the, the kind of bond that develops when you try your best to be there for somebody, and, um, but you still really respect them because you love them so much. And um, but it's not just the giving and the taking, it's the sharing. It's the opportunity to develop new ideas and to explore the Bible together and to really develop new concepts like the women's role and, um, and also to learn yourself and change your character. And to have friends like that, when you do it once, you can do it again. And the devil always tries to get us to believe that and wound our hearts so that we don't want to do it again. But I believe that all of us need 
to always take these things to heart and have friends that are family and family that are friends. Now, unless you get the impression that everything was peaches and cream, let me say, you know, when, when we moved Kip and Elaine into the house, I, I now had two very strong-headed leaders in the house, <laughs> at least. And uh, it wasn't really very long before, you know, the Bible talks about iron sharpening iron, yeah, yeah. before the sparks began to fly. And uh, I remember, you know, it's funny, neither Kip nor Pat really remember the details of what happened here. <laughs> Suffice it to say that, 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 that Kip remembers this as an incident where, where Pat really wasn't a, being a team player. And, and Pat remembers it as an incident where Kip was playing the submission card. But uh, and the, the, the first real conflict happened about two weeks into the relationship. And uh, I remember Pat and Kip were getting heated, and finally Pat says, bro, I think we need to go downstairs and talk this out. And he said, I, I think that's what we need to do. <laughs> and that left me and Elaine upstairs. <laughs> really wondering how all of this was going to work out. But you know, of course, conflict is just a part of being family. And it's not that conflict is so much an issue, it's a question of what you do with it. And, uh, you know, they came back up uh, resolved and at peace with one another. And uh, I remember Pat saying, you know, I, I think it's really important for us never to let Satan get in there and divide us. That we've got to be committed to working through our differences and working through our conflicts to resolution. You know, I really believe God moved us to Boston and uh, saved uh, me in a lot of ways by going there because, um, you know, when we first went to Boston, it was awesome. The first couple of years uh, working in the ministry, it was great studying the Bible with a lot of the college women um, like Joyce and others, uh, BU, and then, uh, of course, um, the other campuses there, incredible campuses there. But I was a bit intimidated working with the older women, and, of course, God put a uh, pad in my life. And a very successful, very high-powered woman, and um, you know something I really wanted to be. Uh, but you know, I had a lot of areas to grow in my character. And I remember even uh, the first few years being in Boston. I worked as an occupational therapist when we were in Charleston, Illinois, and I loved it. I had a great career. And there were times when I wanted to go back to that. Um, and I remember wrestling with a lot of things um, in my heart. Um, you know, whether to go with the world or God, totally being sold out. And Pat really helped me to dry out a lot of those things. Um, she taught me a lot about speaking the truth in love, being open, and um, she had a great ambition for the kingdom. Even though Pat had a great career in the world, her passion was the mission of seeking and saving the lost. She just didn't know how to do it as well as, of course, now. And uh, back in those days, she was very eager. We led a Bible talk together for single professional women, and then I had college Bible talks and other Bible talks going, but, um, you know, I was going back and forth about, did I really want to be a minister's wife? And I know some of you out there have gone through that. Um, because of the role that was in the mainline church, it was still very much a part of even our movement at that time. Um, and I remember even having, you know, three children in a span of four years was very challenging on me physically. Um, and then Sean being born with his uh, back defect um, was very challenging. But I, I felt so much love and support from the Boston Church. I mean, I remember uh, Graham Gumley was the one who found us the doctor that we took him to. Um, the Children's Hospital in Boston uh, was just incredible. Um, all the meals, the support, because Eric was five months old when Sean went through all that surgery. And Olivia was um, a baby still, in a lot of ways, herself. Uh, and I learned a lot of lessons during that time. I learned how much the body meets each other's needs and how much the church was really my family. I mean, Pat was in there organizing all the meals. Uh, she was in there making sure we had rides, because Kip and I would trade off being with Sean and the other one being with Eric at home while still running the ministry. 
Um, and it was a very, very challenging time for me physically. I just think I got wiped out. And uh, I think when you get wiped out physically, it takes a toll on you spiritually. Um, and I don't know what I would have done without Pat in my life. Um, yes, we had our conflicts. And yes, um, you know, it was tough sometimes. Those of you who have been around Pat or close to her, you know, she can be uh, very challenging at times. But I knew she really loved me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I knew that God put us together to really build a great women's ministry. And, um, you know, we learned a lot of things. We taught Wednesday night classes together. Uh, we discipled the women in D groups. Uh, we did a lot together because I just didn't have this, the ump to do everything that needed to be done to keep up with Kip and all the brothers and what all the great things they were doing. Uh, but I really believe we, we studied out passages like Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Titus 2 is a big one, the women training the other women. Um, you know, and I think I really wanted to do that. I think I did do that a lot in Charleston. But in Boston, after the first few years, I just got tired of the battles, the criticism, not just outside of the church, but inside the church. Um, you know, it's hard when your own brothers and sisters that you love so much, you know, can't figure out how to help you, except, you know, by criticism. And I really think, even now, we've got to really watch our hearts. Because um, we can be the ones that destroy each other, not Satan. Um, from our enemies, but Satan from within, our, our own critical, jealous, selfish hearts. And it was really awesome the way um, I, Pat hung in there a lot with me. Um, she discipled me in how to be a young mother, how to be a great wife to Kip, um, and then how to lead the women because, um, you know, we had a long ways to go. I mean, the women were very awesome, very ambitious, very desirous to do great things for God, full of dreams. And, you know, I do believe um, even today we've got to keep implementing Titus too, where the women are teaching the women and training the women in life and in the ministry. Um, because, I mean, it is a challenging time. I mean, a lot of you have been through tough pregnancies or tough things with your children or, or even personal health problems that are very serious. And we've got to figure out how to help each other through these tough times. But I'm very, very grateful for all that God has taught me through those early years in the ministry. And it's awesome to be with you guys today and celebrate. Um, but I, I do believe um, one of the biggest, biggest needs is to keep on helping to support each other and really be in each other's lives to figure out the needs. And then for the women to really practice Titus too and let us do the women's ministry, brothers. You don't have to go study with the women like they did in those early years in Boston. A lot of the brothers were studying with the young college women. and. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that we don't do that so much anymore. Um, but uh, I do want to share that, you know, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if I would be here today if it weren't for the, the Gimples being in our lives and then, of course, uh, the Bairds, because Satan really does come after us as leaders. And uh, you've got to have people to turn to, um, to really pray with you, to help you through those dark times. That discussion that uh, Pat and I had, and then we got back with Bob and Elena. We understood, with them being the most influential family in the church, and Elena and I leading the spiritual charge, that if there was ever division between us, this specialness that we called Lexington would dissipate. And we made a pact at that time to always be best friends and family and to let nothing separate us. It was tested many times, but that was one of the most incredible lessons the hand of God was teaching us is family, is unity based on the purpose of building the church. Let's get out of 1979. Let's go to 1980 right here. At the end of the first year, I, I devised a study series. The Crossroads Ministry had taken a few notes from the Bible chair. In the Crossroads Ministry, they taught classes called Acts and Romans. These were for the college students. They were offered through Harding University for credit. When I came to Boston, I said, hold it. Here's what we're going to do. We're not going to offer these for credit because they won't allow me to teach it for credit. But we're going to have every single member of the congregation go through what we call at that time Acts, which I later expanded into 
first principles. So we all be grounded on first principles. In time then, I remember working over at Harvard, and there's one particular uh, guy that we were having trouble with, and I, I, I was hoping he'd become a disciple. And um, we were talking, and I said, I've got to come up with a study to help this guy see the difference between the Church of Christ and what he's into. And I came up with what I thought was a pretty awesome study, and I just simply called it discipleship. And I gave it to him, and he was convicted, but he never came around. But I thought it was a cool study, so I decided to do it at the Arlington Church building one Wednesday night. I thought this would just fire everybody up. Discipleship. I preached it about having a purpose and uh, 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 about a relationship with God and the fellowship and denying yourself. And once you come to these convictions, then and only then could you be baptized. And th there, was, there was a little mm in the group at that time <laughs> because a lot of them had never done that. <laughs> and so there were some that started to get re-baptized. And we added that to be the first study. Later on, I would use that as I went into other churches to teach about what the true church was, because here was the conviction. So the word discipling was used in the campus ministry movement. The term was lordship and total commitment. We called into it, you go make disciples. We called the members of our church disciples. We came to a conviction from Acts 11, verse 19 through 26, that because the Bible says there at Antioch they were first called Christians, and we know Christians are saved, but the primary nomenclature of those that followed Christ in the first century was disciple, and disciple equals saved equals Christian, and it shook people up. There was now a line that began to be drawn that was making people uncomfortable. I went further and I said, listen, the true church is composed of only disciples. And I knew that we had that at Lexington, soon to be Boston. And it was nowhere else to be found. There were others that wanted it. I believe there were others that wanted it through the centuries. But they didn't want to pay the price of alienation, of criticism, and of condemnation, and of alienation. And we began to preach the first year 103 baptisms, the second year 200 baptisms, the third year 252 baptisms. At the end of 1980, I sent one of the guys I trained, Tim Huffman, into a mainline church as the preacher. I think, well, that's how we'll do it. But once more, he couldn't make the transition we'd made there at Lexington. Soon I began to wrestle. I said, you know, we are just hitting our heads. As Sam talked about, it's just new wine pulled into old wineskins. It's ruining both the wineskins and the wine. What if, what if we were to take a handful of disciples and just plant them in another place? Forget the old wineskin. At the same time, we started thinking about what to do. Marty was running into oppositions there at Northern Illinois University. We were thinking about trying to start different churches. And I remember what we started to wrestle with was, okay, we can plant new churches. Pat suggested that maybe Doug and company would go on over and plant a church over in England. So we took a trip over to visit Cambridge in England and London. At the time, it was campus ministry focused, and the, the greater campus ministry is Cambridge University, but it's a very small town. We went to London University, and it, it's a great school, but London was 12 million people. The church that they were thinking about identifying with was kind of negative in London, but semi-positive in Cambridge. But at the end of it all, I'm going, hold it, do we really want to go back into one of these things? And so out of that trip came an incredible conviction that the Lord put upon my heart. I said, listen, I believe with all of my heart we can take a small number of disciples, plant them in a city, and that becomes the true church. If they fulfill the Great Commission, all you need is that handful of disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, and that whole city can be evangelized. And then it came to me. We don't need to go to Cambridge. It's too small. It's not a key city. Go to London. London's influence is far beyond just the 12 million. It's all of England. It's all of Europe. What you could do, we could target the key cities, the key metropolitan cities around the world. If we could place a handful of disciples in each one of these key cities, 
that would be pillar churches upon which we could build a brotherhood. And those pillar churches then, in time as they grew, could plant churches in the capital cities of the nations around them, who in turn could plant churches in the surrounding smaller cities and towns and villages until every single man in every single nation could hear the gospel in one generation. Are you with me here? Yes. In 1982, in February, we published the famous Lexington Bulletin that targeted the 13 key metropolitan cities of the world, and it shook up the brotherhood. But a lot of people thought it was just talk. But then come June, we sent Marty and Chris to Chicago. And Chicago was a ministry where we scraped together some of the old disciples from my ministry in Charleston, some of the old disciples from Northern University, and we just started with that clump. I still remember Marty calling and said, bro, we had over 100 today at church. I said, amen, bro. A month later, Doug and Joyce and company, eight disciples, just eight disciples from Boston, went to London. And Doug and Joyce were so stoked, they called back, bro, we are really cranking. We had our first service today. With eight disciples, we had 17 total attendants. We knew they were cranky. 1983. <laughs> Johnny Carson was king of television in 1983. Real men didn't eat quiche, but they wore pink shirts with the collars open and gold necklaces and would pierce their ears in Miami Vice came out. There was still a wall between East Berlin and West Berlin, an Iron Curtain. Ronald Reagan was our president. 1983 seems like yesterday to me, and it seems like a whole nother world before. 1983, Sam Lang and Jerry, they'd been in Atlanta, I think, for a year, and had just begun to struggle with a group of people inside that congregation where they were trying to build a ministry. 1983 was the same year that Tom and Kelly Brown uh, left Colorado and went out to Berkeley, California to work with the church in the Bay Area. In 1983, Marty and Chris were still building up in Chicago, and Doug and Joyce invented an evangelistic tool called Blitzing and were scaring people in London every day. It was... <laughs> And in 1983, the, the magnificent, the tremendous, the awesome, all-world Boston Church of Christ had grown to an attendance of about 1,000 on Sundays. Kip had been there for four years, and that magic mark had been hit. And at the time, let me tell you, we thought it was something to do that in four years. And now they do it in Manila in about five minutes. <laughs> In 1983, I wasn't best friends with Doug. In fact, uh, in 1983, I was best friends with my wife, still am. And I'd seen myself as an old man in the ministry, and Kip and I would get together every Tuesday night. And one time, I went in wanting to talk to him about whether or not Lisa and I should start a church. It had become a new thing. We had the one in London, we had the one in Chicago. We had sent out the bulletin, and when we sent out that bulletin, my name wasn't on it to start a church. You see, for me, what I wanted to do was be the co-evangelist with Kip. I wanted it for a number of reasons. One is because I wanted to stay close to Kip, and I believed that that was where I would do my best, and I never, I'd never had anyone minister to me or drive me the way that Kip had. And two, my mindset at that time was there wouldn't be any greater honor in the world than to get to preach opposite of Kip. You see, in those days, in 1983, the Boston Church met in the Arlington Baptist Church building and the Arlington High School right next door. And the Arlington High School was mine. <laughs> and Kip was always over there in the Baptist Church building. We'd have to split the services because we'd grown so much. And so I went in telling Kip that maybe I should go start a church, and I wanted to share this with him, knowing that he would talk me out of it. Knowing he would say, no, Steve, I can get rid of Doug. I can get rid of these other guys. <laughs> but I need you here with me. 
Why, Steve, things would fall apart without you. No, don't go. But I said, maybe I should start a church. He says, bro, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> and he had a globe right there in his study. He said, you could, and he spun it. He said, you could go anywhere. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, what about L.A.? He goes, no, you couldn't go there because Tom Brown wants to go there. But you could go anywhere else. And so the plan evolved for us to go to New York City. And eventually my heart got into it. <laughs> this was long before we would pioneer the arts ministry uh, and really pioneer that ministry for no other reason than simply trying to devise the idea that God didn't ordain you had to go on Wednesday nights and you didn't have to go on Sunday mornings, but, you know, that we needed to reach out to people in various time slots, and once we started doing that, we reached out to more artists than anything else. But my heart got into going to New York with those 18 people. Kip has told the story more than I have. 18 people to 18 million. I think if you drew a radius around Manhattan large enough, you'd encompass 18 million people eventually. Of course, you'd have to add in a lot of the immigrants that they don't add in all the time. <laughs> As we got ready to, to go out, we met in the high school to have the send-off for Lisa and me, and Kip did something that was unprecedented and I don't think repeated. He passed the plate for a love offering to give Lisa and me some money when we left. I'll never forget that. We still had all the, the furniture that basically we'd accumulated since we'd been married. You know, the legs of the sofa were sawed off, you know, so they fit through the door of a, an apartment there in Boston. And, and just everything was sort of, you know, this was back when I was driving down the street the other day and I saw one of those big old wire, uh, uh, what do you call a wheel that you wrap wire around. I was looking at that trying to tell my kids, we used to think those were really cool to make tables out of. <laughs> 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 they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> but in that church building, they took up a collection and Kip said, Steve, I'm going to let you say a few words. And... I shared with them, I said, well, you know, growing up in the Church of Christ, I've seen a lot of different things, and many things which I've not seen in our fellowship here in Boston. I said, but the thing that stands out the most to me of everything, and you see, I'd grown up in churches where preachers only lasted about two years, and the two years they were there, they were usually fighting things out with the elders. And I myself, Lisa and I had gone to Boston because the elders didn't support us in the ministry that we tried to, to stir things up in down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so I stood up that night, and I said, there's, there's many things that are different about the church. I said, but the thing that, that to me will always make this ministry unique is that the elders and the ministers love each other. But more than that, they're friends. Amen. They're best friends. I have a great privilege right now to share about 1984. And truly, I just want to say it's a humbling thing to think back to what God did in my life because it reflects so much even what we're going to talk about for a second. You know, after having planted two churches in 1982 and one church in 1983, for the Boston Church, 1984 was a great challenge. Sin crept into the camp of the Paris planting, and the whole plan had to be called off. So in 1984, there was actually no new churches planted. But on the positive side, the uniqueness of Boston and its planting was was coming to the attention of people all over the world. The fact that Chicago had baptized 59 the first year, London 52, New York 61, this was being talked about in the fellowship of the churches of Christ. And really what was amazing was God was calling people out of all these different factions. And it's just amazing to think what had happened. This mainline church, which I grew up in, my family's been in it in the 1871 census of Canada. I have two relatives, disciples of Christ. But you know what? This church was so divided and so autonomous, we couldn't even understand the word unity at all. People came from the main line, they came from the Christian churches, Crossroads Campus Ministries, all the other campus ministries, bus ministries, black churches, one cuppers, all these different things. The anti-Sunday school, Harding University, Abilene, my alma mater, Oklahoma Christian, International Bible College, Northeastern Great Lakes Christian College, from all these different places, Sunset School of Pre Preaching, Preston Road. And see, what was amazing was in in Boston was being called from all these different factions. 
people by the Holy Spirit. You know, my own story is interesting just that I grew up in the church and from age six wanted to be a missionary. My father became a wealthy man by the late 60s and was personally supporting a large part of what was going on in mission work, at least that was being supported from Canada. And I had missionary people coming into my home all the time. They would stay overnight, they'd report, and it really impacted me. And I had this dream from six years old, I'm going to be a missionary. And at age 13, I targeted very specifically Papua New Guinea because of a Canadian minister who had targeted that area. And really was committing myself to be his disciple, to go anywhere. And I finished high school, finished ACU in 1979, and went immediately over there. But then life caught up with me. One, as I was over there in the mission field, these churches, these missions, they were autonomous. And these, we'd have these missionary meetings, but they were disunified. People are actually yelling at each other in these meetings, walking out with unresolved attitudes. People arguing, because when they'd been on their six-month furloughs, some other evangelist that they'd been raising up now had gone over to someone else, and he didn't want to come back. But they left for six months, thinking that they could just, the church would just grow. And sadly, I made a decision after being over there for six months that I, wouldn't, I didn't want to be a missionary anymore. And just to show you the division in the mainline church, I never wanted to be an evangelist. I wanted to be a missionary because being an evangelist in a North American church and being a missionary, in my mind, were two totally different things. And I was part of the missionary camp. George was one of my professors at ACU, and Irene and George were dear friends. And they just continually pumped vision into people like me. But you know, in 1980, I came back very disillusioned from Papua New Guinea. And then impurity and different things, my own life caught up with me. So that by 1982, a, a young man who brought people to the mainline church his whole teenage life, brought visitors, been fired up, was in the lowest point of his whole existence. And I went to the first World Mission Seminar in 1982 and heard a very then familiar lesson to the Boston church. It was called discipleship. And I'll never forget, it was the old Tremont Baptist Temple downtown Boston. I just went up, when the lesson was over, you couldn't find me. I just went into a stairwell, went to the very top of it, a dead end, and cried for an hour. Because now I'm 24 years old, and as a young child, I'd wanted to do something great for God, but, but at every way, it, it failed because of my own sin, and really because of the lack of unity that was in the mainline church. And really what I'm here to say to you is that the Holy Spirit moved in an incredible way. Because the story I just told, I know that many other people here could tell. That God had mercy on us. And through the beacon of light that was created by the Boston church, we were pulled out of darkness and given a mission of which we were eternally grateful. Thank you. My name is uh, Mark Mancini, and the year is 1985. Highlighting this year was the sending out of Boston's fourth planning, the Toronto Mission Team, co-led by myself and Henry Creed, a Canadian. This was significant because Toronto represented the third nation to be reached with the gospel. Our mission team consisted of 24 individuals mostly Americans, and we were going to a rather atheistic country. I remember that uh, for the 10 days prior to our first service, we gave out close to 10,000 invitations on the streets of Toronto. And we set what at the time was an incredible faith go of having 100 at our first service, and we counted it twice, and God gave us 101 people at the very first service. Even more exciting, the first year of the Toronto Church, 24 disciples saw 108 baptized into Christ, making it the first planning to have 100 or more baptisms in its first year. I could share more about the Canadian work but I believe it would be more helpful to tell you a little bit of what was going on around that year and that time period and the events leading up to that great planting. 
1977, I was converted and baptized back at uh, the university in Illinois that Kip first went to. I spent two years walking with him every day in a daily relationship with intense training. The same summer that Kip left to go to Boston, my wife and I were sent to a traditional Church of Christ by Kip to be the campus ministry couple at the University of Missouri. Now, just for the record, I wanted to be one of the 30 would-be disciples. <laughs> and I would have been one of the would-be's, but no one asked me to be a would-be disciple. And I just want to make that clear. In spite of that, God blessed us with a very successful campus ministry and a rather traditional Church of Christ. And within two years, several hundred students had come to the Lord. After speaking at our campus retreat in the spring of 1982 there in Missouri, our guest speaker, Chuck Lucas, about two weeks later, phoned me up and shocked me by giving me the invitation to come and be the campus minister at the Crossroads Church of Christ that several of the brothers shared about. I... Uh, I was rather shocked. I was extremely nervous that this opportunity had come my way. But I remember very specifically Kip, who was obviously still discipling me through that whole time, really encouraged me to go. And I think that's important for you to know because this was very significant in that Boston had been going now a couple of years, and it was a real effort to try to pull crossroads into them, the young movement of God from Boston. Kip tried to uh, prepare me for what I would find when I went down there. I knew I was uh, going to find some interesting things because so many of the Crossroads brothers who were leading campus ministries shared that they were excited for me, but also shared a lot of sympathy and said they were glad they weren't me. <laughs> when I got there, what I found even shocked myself with all the preparation I had. I found by this point in 1982, we had a congregation at Crossroads where the elders and the evangelists were clearly pitted against each other. And I was told in the first few weeks I was there, you didn't go back to the back office of the elders, and we didn't do business in that way. And there was a definite power play for control and direction of that church. I discovered staff members who were very shaky on the most basic of doctrines of salvation. Discipling had all but disappeared in the Crossroads Church by 1982. I was forbidden from using the term discipleship partner. I was called on the carpet for talking about intensity. I had no one in that church in my life. I was operating as an island. Even though I had a prayer partner, I could only convince him to get with me three times in two years. Not surprisingly, it would come out later that there was serious, unconfessed sin in the leadership of that church. The adult ministry, I found to my surprise, was like, in many ways, the adult ministry that I had left behind in Columbia, Missouri, in the traditional church there. Evangelism was clearly not expected, Total commitment was the ideal to strive for, in no way, the expectation in the married ministry. I remember, ultimately, sharing my excitement as Kip continued to throw me a lifeline from Boston during those two years, 82 to 84, at Crossroads. And we were in weekly touch, and he was giving me a lot of direction for my campus ministry, which I desperately needed. And I remember, towards the end of those two years, writing down some of the things that I was excited that I was learning from Kip and the Boston Church and bringing that into the office to share with the lead evangelist. And I'll never forget him taking that paper from me and wadding it up and literally throwing it back in my face. And for all purposes, forbidding me to have an ongoing relationship with that congregation. It was then that I realized after two years I was handcuffed unsupported, and that by now things had gotten to such a chill that there was a great division occurring between the traditional Church of Christ that I found myself in 
and the Boston movement that had begun. And I told Kip clearly, I had to leave. I remember making the decision to leave and talking to the staff, and I'll never forget that Sunday night where I was going to make the announcement that I was going to move to Boston and leave the Toronto mission team. And the lead evangelist got up that night at that 6 p.m. service, preached the word, and then at the end of it he said, and now our campus minister, Mark, has an announcement he wants to make. And he walked down in front of the whole congregation and walked out of the auditorium and left the back door in full view of everyone. And I got up and shared my excitement to go to Boston. And uh, to say the least, that's a memory I'll never forget. <laughs> when I moved to Boston in 1994, knowing that I needed to be discipled on a daily basis once again, that I was not equipped to plant or to build a church, I can't tell you how refreshing it was to see the relationship among the staff and among the membership that you saw described up here in this session earlier by the Gimples and the McKeans and Steve Johnson. To be in that daily relationship, elders and evangelists who loved each other, total commitment being preached not as the exception, but as the norm, the standard. And after nine months of intense training in 1985, the mission team left for Toronto on a great send-off that year. And from that mustard seed of 24, there are now seven churches all throughout Canada, from Vancouver to Halifax. And as over 3,000, 3,500 Canadians gather every Sunday morning to proclaim how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. So I'm very appreciative of, of all those that influenced me at the Crossroads Ministry and uh, all those that gave me the chance of having salvation. I think it's um, perhaps unaware to some of you how big the division had grown by that time. Um, at this point, I was fairly um, well known, and so I got to speak at a lot of churches, but I was getting canceled by the brothers from Crossroads. On the other hand, and God was at work, I was getting a lot of invitations from the mainline church at Soul Winning Workshops and other campus ministry type situations. Of course, God was setting up these relationships. Um, the separation, I think, became more and more apparent because when Chuck stepped down out of the ministry in 85, the brothers from Crossroads felt a real void. Sam had left, of course. He was at Highlands, in Highlands. And there, there was no leadership. I was very much cut off. There were very intense views about Boston. There were absolute overtures towards the leadership to pull them on in. A few of the brothers came. About half the guys from Crossroads eventually came into the movement. The other half did not. And it becomes some of my most bitter enemies. Again, the Lord was at work and God's kingdom was forcefully advancing. In 1986 was one of the most incredible years in the kingdom. Johannesburg is planted. That was incredible. We just invited 27 people over to the Gimple's house, half black, half white. We said, hey, why don't you go to Johannesburg? 22 of them signed up, and we planted the church in Johannesburg, South Africa, before apartheid was struck down as a law. Three months after we get there, apartheid was struck down as law. God blessed our faith. Amen. Amen. We went to Paris and Stockholm. The criticism against church, oh, you've done all the easy churches. You've gone to English-speaking nations, America, England, and Canada, but you can't cross the language barrier. We planted the churches in Paris and Stockholm, and God blessed those results. Amen. The need for money was incredible. There was this challenge in one of the mainline newspapers. Where is the church? That's not going to use a million dollars to build a building to glorify themselves, but where is the church that give a million dollars for missions? Well, Al Baird saw it. We gave the challenge to the Boston church, and we became the first church in the history of God's movement to give a million dollars for missions. I'll be sharing about 1986 and then what took place in 1987. 
Marie and I moved to Boston in 85. It was actually the day that Toronto was sent out. And because of Scott Green, we got to Boston and the vision he had for us. And 13 months later, after having been trained by the Greens and Phil and Donna Lamb, we got a call and Kip wanted us to go to Kingston, Jamaica. I asked him, uh, are there many white people there? <laughs> because I was wondering why me? And then uh, I said, well, can we go visit? And he said, no, we don't have enough time. <laughs> what had happened was Barry Mafood, a brother who came out of the campus ministry churches, had gone down there and started a church, and it was just floundering. And he was hurting, and he wanted some help. And he was basically the first guy to say, in humility, would you help me? And so as a result, we put together a team. And I remember Kip finding some others, Frank Hines, out of the teen ministry, off of Harvard, Janet V.C. Florent, Beverly Davis, and David Fennell, all black. Men, I felt a little more secure there. All I had heard previous to going when I started telling people I was going to Kingston was, wow, there's a lot of violence down there. And uh, basically what happened was we had about two months, and in December, Marie and I went on down with our newborn, Jessica, and then Kip, Elena, Phil, and Donna came on down to join us, and we met with the Mafoods, and we talked to them about where the church was at, and basically there was 80 members on the roll, 50 of them attended church, and they had varying commitment. So we called the church together on a Friday night. And I'll never forget it. Keep, Kip basically preached, and he did the discipleship study, as he always did, in a loving way. I personally recommitted myself three times to the Lord. And I had to remind myself he was talking to the members there, you know. But then we had, Kip, we had an invitation, as, you know, we used to do back then and probably still need to do it, but it was unlike any invitation I had ever seen. What Kip did was he basically said, if you want to be a member, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus and a part of the Lord's church, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make Jesus Lord, and then we will study the Bible with you, and basically what we would do is go through the first principle study with everyone to make sure that we had a base of disciples, nothing but disciples in the church. But then he did something I'll never forget. He literally came out from behind the podium, took his foot, and drew a line. And it was intense because he said, you must cross this line if you want to be a part of the Kingston Church of Christ. Marie and I immediately got up and crossed the line. <laughs> Phil and Donna joined. We all ran up there. And we sang two verses of a song, you know, as they were going to respond. And, and Kit stopped the song. Two people had crossed, and he looked at the people, as Kip can do like no other, in a loving way, <laughs> and he said he was not kidding, and he really admonished them, and, and seriously, in an intense and yet loving and spiritual way, and it was unbelievable to see what the Holy Spirit was doing. Along with the five of us from Boston, 40 crossed that line. And there were many who sat out there, and Kip said, I'll respect you if you decide you're not ready, because he really was serious. So then we split up men and women and went into separate rooms and just had a time to confess sin. And there was all kinds of sin that was confessed in the men's group. I also heard there was a lot of sin confessed in the women's group. And 
We then studied with every member, and this was in December. All this took place at the end of 86. And we began January 1st, 1987, with 47 committed disciples in the Kingston Church of Christ. I'll never forget, on the Saturday after the Friday, we sat down, Kip met with us, and as Kip does, you know, he had vision, and he wanted to have that as a pillar church for the Caribbean, and he wanted to set some goals, and he wanted to find out what were the, you know, the key cities in the Caribbean, and, and he, wanted to, he asked Barry, he said, bro, we got to set a goal for uh, uh, baptisms, he said to us. And he goes, Barry, how many baptisms, what's the most you ever had? And ba Barry said, 50. He goes, great, our goal will be 100. I looked at Kip, I said, 100? <laughs> he goes, bro, if they can baptize 50 with uncommitted disciples. <laughs> I was silent, and I borrowed his faith. And it was amazing. We then proceeded to divvy out to the five of us, well, actually the three, uh, the cities, and said, you're going to plant this church, and you're going to plant this church, and the vision. And it was incredible because what God did in the first year with a goal to have 100 baptisms, we saw 115 baptized into Christ in 1987. And then in 19... 88, an amazing thing happened where after uh, being there for a few months in that year, uh, before a Sunday morning service, uh, I was about to go up to preach, and a policeman came up and asked me to step outside. And basically, they told me I could no longer preach. And so from May till August, I was there, and I never preached. But because we had a base of disciples, and we had a goal of baptizing 200 that year, and then in August, the Mufuds came on back after having been trained. And it was amazing to see because we left in August. But by having a base and a church of disciples only, God blessed. And that church had over 200 baptized in 1988. And we became the first reconstruction as it was known in our movement. And the rest is history to God's glory. It did, it did give birth to an incredible time. Certainly, 87 can be marked with incredible church plantings to Mexico City with the Lambs, Buenos Aires, Hong Kong, of course, with the Greens, and of course, Bombay, and the One Suitcase Challenge with uh, Jim and Donna Blau. That was awesome. But what, what was really happening right here was much more than just people getting com committed. We were getting our Bibles opened. One of the things that had marked the first year with the Gimples was really wrestling with the women's role. We literally got the Bible open at the Gimples' um, dining room table, and the four of us would study about the women's role. Pat would have this scripture, I would have this scripture. Really go, well, we, the whole Bible is inspired, okay, and we got it all together, and that really put a heart into us, let's study the Bible. The Bible has the solutions. That heart was put in to the movement at that point. Through the years, we began to wrestle with, now hold it, if, if, if these so-called churches aren't really true churches because they're not full of disciples, then maybe even what they believe are not really the Bible beliefs, but they are traditions in the Church of Christ. Maybe they are, in fact, the very things that are blocking the Spirit of God from moving across the nations in this generation. I mean, bottom line, we had to really wrestle with who is a true Christian. And we said, listen, it's a baptized disciple. We were clear that she had to be baptized for remission of sins. Secondly, the true church was composed of only disciples. Thirdly, ministers trained ministers like disciples disciple disciples. Because a lot of the guys in the campus ministry movement wanted to go to the Christian colleges, and very often they lost their faith there. We believe that every single member had to be discipled. At the Crossroads movement, they had prayer partners, where you would literally ask someone else to be your prayer partner or buddy up. Sometimes we'd have men and women being prayer partners. I said, no, we're going to have discipleship partners. And we're going to decide who needs to disciple you. And that way, every single person had a meaningful discipling relationship. Thirdly, we believed in discipleship groups. Yes, the Bible talks, or soul talks in the old days, function as evangelistic units. But the discipleship group, where we pounded out unity, iron sharpens iron, this became a foundation of what we had, particularly at the leadership levels. We believe that even the leaders needed to be discipled and disciples. We also had deep convictions as we wrestled through time with how church government should be. One of the most interesting things was not really Jamaica, because that was simple. As our pattern became, we always took the lead 
couple or the lead couples out of influence and brought them the train. We then would send a train minister on in and call all the people to be disciples. If, if people's baptisms in the past were valid, amen, we'd recognize them. But if they'd never made the decision to be disciples and then were baptized, then they were rebaptized. And so we had a base of disciples. Very interestingly, um, one of the most uh, interesting reconstructions was with the Browns out of Berkeley. As with Lexington was perched on the edge of Boston, so many Church of Christ were perched on the edge of the big city, someday hoping maybe that they'd go into the big city and do something. Berkeley was there at the University of California, Berkeley, but it was just basically for Berkeley. And yet in America, we have the metropolitan areas. Tom said, hey, you know, we're desperate. We want to join up. Is there any way we can graft on into the Boston movement? And at that time, even in our movement, this is hard for you to understand. When we sent out Doug and Steve and these guys, we sent them out with the term they were fully trained. With the idea that those churches were autonomous. And those guys acted that way. There's <laughs> a little attitude. I know. It came on out right there. Amen. But as we studied the Bible, there was a, a unity. And I said, hold it. Autonomy is not in the Bible. Brotherhood is. And so I tried to try to wrestle with what was the church government that was followed. Yes, the elders and the evangelists led these churches. But what was the church government? Now, I remember with, with Tom, he said, well, maybe the elders in Boston can be over the church in San Francisco. And we wrestled with such situations. I said, at, after time of wrestling with scripture, I said, hold it. The evangelists were the ligaments of the movement. And that's why we have this meeting right here. And so... We had evangelists discipling other evangelists in other congregations. Secondly, we went to a one church in one city. There was one church in Jerusalem. There was one church at Ephesus. There was one church in the great metropolitan cities of the New Testament. And so with the Berkeleys, we no longer made it the Berkeley Church of Christ. It became the San Francisco Church of Christ, where we'd reach out to the whole metropolitan area. We sent the Greens on in to lead the Reconstruction, brought the Browns to Boston, for further training on how to build the churches. And once more, we called the people to repentance. Some were rebaptized, some were accepted into our fellowship. Another interesting reconstruction was that done in Atlanta. And in Atlanta, it was very interesting. That was where Sam had gone. And Sam and them had gotten pretty discouraged because once more they were hitting their heads against this traditional element. And, I mean, Sam had become so discouraged. I mean, even thinking about getting out of the ministry. I remember the elders getting with Sam, me getting with Sam. And I had not really talked to Sam for a couple of years up to this point. I'd gone down and called him on up, and we got re in contact right there. But we got into that situation, and I said, okay, we've got to have the Atlanta Church of Christ. They just had typical two churches of Christ, Atlanta Highlands, that kind of area there. And in the meantime, some of the guys had done some legal maneuvers, and they wanted to have all the legal rights, and so they pulled back. The legal rights, I said, Sam, we just got to meet. We just got to call the disciples, the people that want to be disciples, to meet with us tonight. Sam says, amen. We went for it. We met that night. And that night, Al and myself preached on Friday and Saturday and on Sunday. And by Sunday, we had formed the Atlanta Church of Christ. <laughs> Sam had come on in with us, which was significant to the other brothers, particularly in Crossroads, particularly with Tom's coming. Um, and I appreciate Sam's humility in that. I, I, I mean, the, the number two guy in the movement at Crossroads willing to come on into Boston, that was huge. That was huge. At the same time, we, 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 we began to wrestle with, okay, um, bottom line, um, in, in, in the kingdom, we don't believe in autonomy. And even the other church plantings had to be brought into these teachings, which is really tough for you to understand. Sometimes people hear about a little conflict with the world's sector leaders. Let me tell you something. It's never been as unified as it is right now. <laughs> At this same time, it also historic, was the Christian Chronicle called us on up and said, listen, we're going to drop all the Boston churches from the list because we were dominating all the baptism lists. We used to have a list of baptizing 100. It's just all of our churches. Then I got a call from Mac Lynn, who did the book called Where the Saints Meet. And they'd always identify which faction of the Church of Christ was in. He says, Skip, I was just kind of wondering, do you guys still want to be called uh, Church of Christ Boston? Or he'd put CCB. He says, do you guys still want to be in it? He says, you know, in a way, there's just a, a bigger, bigger gap. He says, really, there's a doctrinal gap between us now. 
And Mac was one of my teachers at Harding Graduate School. I said, well, Mac, really, we're not the same fellowship. He says, you know, I agree. I says, well, I guess that's it, huh? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I guess so. I said, okay, talk to you later. Amen. That was it. I go, I, I said, I think I better call the elders on this one. That was, that was, that was a big decision to make over the phone. At the end of it all, at the end of it all, these reconstructions were amazing because now there was no difference between a Boston church planting and a reconstruction. A lot of people wonder, well, where did the reconstruction idea come from? Because of all the things that were happening, I was trying to, to work in the kingdom. I thought about the reconstructions in the South after the Civil War. I said, I want something that's radical sounding something that's raw, something that grates. I said, I want people to know there's been a radical change. They just don't slip in to the Boston movement. I remember saying, did we call this a reconstruction? But the thing really hit the fan in the Church of Christ when after Sunday in Atlanta, we just had the, the meeting Sunday, Al and I were getting on the Delta flight, Atlanta back to Boston, we had staff meeting in the morning, on Monday morning. And uh, I said, you know, Al, for all, it'd be really great if you could do this week's bulletin article. Hey, and you know, Al is Mr. I'll do anything for you. And he goes, you know, bro, I'm just really beat. <laughs> How about you do it? I go, bro, I've been preaching? He said, well, I've been preaching. And I'm older, you know. Da, 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 uh. So, so we get on the plane. Al gets his usual three seats and lays down, and I have to write the bulletin article for the morning. So I'm flipping through the Bible, go, well, oh man, that's oh, that's kind of cool. The remnant comes back, and that's that's awesome. God calls the remnant. Good. And I, I just talked about the remnant. I said that's cool sounding. The remnant. That's what we are. So I write this cool bulletin article on up. I was pretty proud of myself, cranking at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I talked about how all the different factions in the Church of Christ and even the Christian Church and the black churches of Christ were coming on in, that nothing like this had happened. And as per usual, I ran it by the elders in the morning. Al, what do you think? Looks good. Bob, what do you think? Looks good. That's awesome. We ran it, and all heck broke loose. <laughs> because we believed that the Holy Spirit was calling the remnant out of the whole world into the one true movement of God. We're all going to get convinced about how awesome the Spirit of God has moved in our generation. And that we need to do even greater things. But I think it's so important that we understand what has been done and the sacrifice and the radical decisions that it took to accomplish it. Just as much as there were radical decisions on doctrine, there was radical decisions on the style of our services. A lot of influence from a lot of the black churches. Uh, hand clapping was anathema in the mainline church. Humming, you couldn't do that. Singing amen, well, that was, that was, that was Pentecostal. But let me tell you something, in Hebrew it means so be it. And if you agree with what one of the brothers is saying, you just go ahead and say amen. amen. By 1988, things had gotten radical and everybody was trying to take it a notch higher. And uh, Bob and Lori Tranchel were slated to go and plant a church in Italy, but somehow that just wasn't radical enough. And so they asked Kip if they could change and target Cairo, Egypt. And so they took the first team to a Muslim nation, Cairo, Egypt, in 1988. By that time, we had 35 churches in 15 nations, and guess who was discipling all of them? Kip, along with his 18 discipleship partners in Boston. And so several of us in the, among that number said, Kip, we'd like to talk. And so we had another meeting in the Gimple living room. And we said, Kip, 
what you're doing is not good, for you are us. Brother, you need to focus on a few. And we urge you to go back and consider and pare down who you really can pour your life into. So Kip did that. He prayed about it. He said, you know, this really is right. He thought about it. He prayed about it for five months. It really took five months because there were a lot of people who said, bro, I'd like to help you out as being one of those numbers. <laughs> and uh, so, so Kip had to come up with what's the criteria really going to be, and he came up with some simple criteria. Number one, it needed to be someone that he had a Paul-Timothy relationship with already. It had to be that kind of a close relationship. Number two, it had to be a husband and wife team, both of whom were effective in the ministry. And uh, finally, the, he had mercy on a few of us other people, realizing he needed some older people in his life, in Elena's life. And so these really were the criteria. He prayed and thought about this for nine months and got a lot of advice, and finally came up with nine couples to be world sector leaders. And they were Doug and Joyce Arthur, uh, Gloria and myself, Tom and Kelly Brown, Bob and Pat Gimple, uh, Scott and Lynn Green, Steve and Lisa Johnson, Phil and Donna Lamb, Frank and Erica Kim, Randy and Kay McKean. Uh, in 1989, unfortunately, the Browns stepped down because of family problems, and Marty and Chris Fuquay were appointed to take their place. Uh, Corey and Megan Blackwell were appointed in 1994. Uh, in 1998, uh, Phil and Donna Lamb had to step down for family and health reasons. Uh, Peter and Laura Garcia Bangachea was, were appointed to take their place. Uh, in 1999, just last year, Andy and Tammy Fleming were appointed uh, to lead administration, education, and the kingdom teachers. Uh, and uh, this year, Corey and Megan have had to step down because of family problems. Uh, and Kip and Elena have assumed that role of leading the Middle East. And of course, Russ and Gail Ewell have been appointed to lead the net world sector. And that takes us to 1989. 1989 was a great year of revelation. That was the year that we realized that evangelists do not have the gift of administration. <laughs> and so we appointed world sector administrators that year, and uh, they were a great relief to all of us, of course, headed by Cecil and Helen Wooten that God had raised up in that way. Uh, in 1989, George and Irene, you've already heard the story with Frank and Erica, reconstructed the church in Tokyo, which of course now is the largest Christian church of any type in the history of all of Japan. Uh, this was the year that Gloria and I were leading Boston. It was the last Boston World Mission Seminar that year. We had 12,000 there in Boston Garden. And uh, I remember that year well because that was the year that we had set a goal of sending out seven church plantings from Boston involving 120 Bible Talk Leader Strength people. That, for your information, was one-third of our Bible Talks of the Boston church. And it did obviously had an impact on the Boston church in terms of, of having to deal with that and raise up leaders. But let me tell you what it really did. Those 120 Bible Talk leaders, here we are 11 years later, they now represent churches, those seven churches that represent 19,000 members with an attendance of 28,000. That is the power of God. Somehow this story never gets old. We need to be encouraged what the Holy Spirit did with one man and one woman who simply believed the scriptures and were totally committed to God's plan. We see the multiplication of disciples one disciple making another disciple. But just like God's church, we see the multiplication of churches. One church multiplying another church. I am inspired by the prominence of the role of women in God's modern day movement. I deeply appreciate the leaders and how they wrestled with scriptures to see God's plan for women to lead and baptize women. Theodore Roosevelt once said, it's not the critic who counts. The credit goes to the man who is actually in the arena. It requires no faith or talent to be a critic or cynic. And in actuality, these types of people don't build up God's church. We are hearing from disciples in God's modern day movement 
who are making history through the power of the Holy Spirit. The challenge is for each one of us to feel the faith and the heart of these ordinary people whom God is using to do extraordinary things. God is calling each one of us and simply saying to us, I have chosen you. The story just gets better. In the next segment, we will see the miraculous things God did from 1990 to the new millennium. The best history you will ever see. Soul by soul, follow me.